Hello and welcome to a new episode of Bit by Bit Leadership Conversation. I am not in my home office. I'm actually at Qualcomm in San Diego. I'm here with Chris Patrick, who is SVP of Handsets and Wearable at Qualcomm. And what I want to talk about is something that we haven't talked for about two minutes, AI. <laughs> thank you for being here and thank you for having me as a, as a guest on uh, Qualcomm Soil today. And I want to start with the fact that we were both in San Jose for uh, the launch of the new S25 series with Samsung. And you have obviously done uh, some magic to your chipset and a collaboration that you have had for quite some time now with, uh, with uh, Samsung for the high end of their devices. So right. the uh, Snapdragon 4 Galaxy. Can you talk to me a little bit more about what that collaboration entails? Sure, uh, and great to see you, Carolina. Uh, so yeah, we've uh, worked with Samsung obviously for many decades. You know, I personally actually worked with, on, with Samsung on Samsung devices, uh, I think for more than two decades. Um, so yeah, so we have a very long collaboration uh, with, with Samsung. I think what we realized as we, we spoke to them uh, a few years ago is that, yeah, I think if we designed an incredible chipset, then they designed an incredible phone, we were still leaving some opportunities uh, on the table. If we thought of it almost as co-design, mm -hmm. right, where we, we're designing some of the underlying technology and hardware, and then they're overall owning the system and, and, some of the, and how it gets uh, instantiated for the end user, we had an opportunity to do even better things and uh, have an even better user impact. That's when we started this sort of full galaxy uh, concept. Uh, first one, uh, I think two years ago, um, that was, I think, very impactful, focusing mostly on CPU, GPU, and then some system aspects. Uh, but here now we've broadened that collaboration uh, to go across the platform and, and do more uh, still. Of course, we're working heavily with them on AI. You know, I think you mentioned uh, AI. I heard it's a, a trending uh, 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 <laughs> Just buzz, a little bit, uh, yes. word uh, nowadays. <laughs> so yeah, obviously getting mentioned a lot for good reason. Um, but that's one place where we're collaborating very deeply on bringing these incredible models to life in a low power way, uh, kind of et cetera. Uh, but you know, there's other aspects of the design as well. Obviously camera, we've been very closely uh, working with Samsung for yeah. many years on camera. Um, they mentioned some of their new uh, nitography uh, feature, which is incredible video capture in low light conditions. So we worked very closely with them on some, some new custom techniques with their specific sensor. Uh, and then they talked about a couple of things on display. Uh, mm -hmm. that maybe uh, your, your listeners uh, caught. Um, they mentioned something called ProScaler and then another block called MDNIE, if I got that right, um, also on the display uh, side that provide some incredible improvements in kind of visual quality on the screen as well as actually lower power when our chip is talking to their display. Mm -hmm. So again, opportunities if we work closely together to do more and cooler things that impact the end user. Does that opportunity um magnify as, as you're thinking about AI as far as the optimization of really how your silicon runs on their hardware and the other way around? Absolutely. On-device AI is uh, one of the most challenging things we've really ever had to do on these chipsets on the phone. So you think of uh, on the cloud side of things, we have these hundreds of billions of parameter uh, models, uh, incredible air-cooled mm -hmm. um, kind of racks of, of equipment. And now we want to reproduce you know, a subset of those experiences just with this uh, very tiny device with a tiny battery. Uh, so it requires, for example, taking those floating point models and doing what's called fixed point quantization to make them smaller, uh, more compact, more power efficient. We have to do things like work very closely with Samsung on uh, things like what we call speculative decode that runs one version of the model and a, another version of the model, whichever one ends earlier, you use that one to improve latency and improve response time. Anyway, it takes really tight cooperation uh, to bring some of these experiences to life on device and then provide everything that on device can get you. You know, universal kind of access, even if you don't have data connection, uh, security, immediacy, everything that that brings. You mentioned so many key words as far as you know, security, lack of latency, and everything speaks to a higher, tighter experience for the consumer. You mentioned earlier that obviously you've been working on AI for quite some time, starting with the camera and audio as well. If you're thinking about generative AI in particular, what are some of the features that we already can experience today, whether it is on the S25 or the plethora of devices that sure. Qualcomm is empowering? Sure. And you mentioned camera. Uh, so camera is always the first uh, in, in And what consumers ways. care a lot And about. consumers care a lot. Um, 
in the end, you know, I was looking out, uh, I was thinking about some of the things we discussed today, and I was looking out my window uh, upstairs, um, and I have some, some blinds in front of me, I have uh, some glass that's a little bit dirty, but if I look out, I don't see those things, right? Mm -hmm. Instead, kind of, I see the view, um, and I see the beautiful San Diego um, hills kind of uh, there, right? Because my whole, my eyes and my brain, my whole system is already tuned to sort of edit out the things that, that don't matter, that's not really what I'm looking at. You know, so generative AI is part of how we do fundamentally kind of image processing uh, now. You, know, you get these very raw pixels from the camera, and then we have to synthesize that into really the image that, that you see, just like you see mm -hmm. with your eyes. You know? So generative AI is more and more tightly integrated into camera processing, so that's a way that I think everybody interacts with generative AI. But in terms of more generative AI sort of forward uh, use cases, um, you know, I think we're all going to uh, experience it in different ways. I think different tools uh, will be different for it. Will be um, kind of more resonant for different people. Yeah. Uh, for me myself, you know, I'm having an interesting time playing with um, uh, on-device translation uh, mm -hmm. tools. So I find that find those very interesting. I spend a lot of time traveling the world, you know, talking to customers about what they want for the next uh, platform. And so often those uh, conversations are not priority uh, in English. Yep. So having a device that's able to kind of listen um, and transcribe and give me some sense of the conversation going like on device where I may not have Wi-Fi, um, data coverage may be expensive, mm -hmm. uh, may not be available, uh, the Gen AI capabilities may not be available in the cloud in some of those countries. So instead I have that all on device with me. So it's incredibly powerful to have this on these small portable devices. I think we, we tend as an industry always to focus on what is sounds really exciting and maybe a little bit complicated because then sure. it sounds better. But to me, if I think about AI and the, uh, the power that AI has is really to transform every user in a power user. That's right. And especially with something small as, as a phone, you, first of all, it's the size of a phone, but then it's also that you're always out and about and using it in a different way. Our patience is very tiny, <laughs> at least mine is. So AI will actually help us cut corners and get things done in a faster way. I think that that's the value that maybe from a user perspective, most obvious, but there, we're bombarded with so much that I'm, I'm curious what your elevator pitch is when you're talking to maybe people that are not as tech savvy as you are as to what the value of AI really is. Sure. Yeah, I think there's the value of AI right now. What can I show you that's on yes. your phone today? And that's, that's good. I think we're doing really incredible things that were not possible just a couple of years ago. Uh, but I would often answer that question, kind of the value, maybe one or two years uh, from now. And we saw big hints uh, at mm -hmm. Galaxy S25 uh, unpacked, which is exactly what you said, right? Your phone is incredibly capable. It has these fantastic apps that can do uh, incredible things. Um, we just moved, my family and I moved to a new home. And so, of course, as a tech guy, I wanted everything uh, <laughs> completely technical, incredible. So I have an app for the you know, water heater sends me notifications. My front door sends me notifications. Cameras send me things. My fridge sends me uh, notifications. Anyway, it's uh, overwhelming, right? So really, uh, that's not really what I want. I'm yeah. very excited about that technology, but I really want my phone to help me, right? To offload me so I don't have to expend my mental cycles on processing exactly the state of my fridge uh, each time I want to send me a note, right? So if my phone can help me, really an agent on that device can, can grow and really represent uh, my needs and sort of take care of things. Mm -hmm. That's really what I want. I want sort of an assistant who's working for me, who's helping me on my device um, and can help me. So this is, this is kind of my pitch. So this is, if I'm talking to my wife, I'm saying this is what it's going to do for you is instead of getting the 200 notifications every day, it'll tell you just the ones you really need and really help you. Yeah, what you need to pay attention to. What you to. need to pay attention to. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I'm hoping that you would agree that AI will change a little bit the relationship that we have with our phone. We're always looking at other devices and, and on the positive side for Qualcomm is that you're on so many different devices that, you know, if I'm thinking about XR as an example, sure. you know, you're in there too. So if we switch and we spend more time on an XR device versus smartphone, you still win. But in my opinion, you know, the phone is here to stay for quite some time. It's the most precious device that we carry every day. But the relationship might change. How mm -hmm. do you think about that? Do, do you see the relationship with your phone apart from you know, maybe getting surface more information or not having to be 
you know, looking at your screen all the time. Do you think AI is going to change how we feel about our phones? I think it will it'll change how we feel. Um, I think there's a potential to kind of integrate those different devices. Mm -hmm. And we talk about, uh, again, I, I work on uh, wearables, watches as well, and earbuds, and then my colleagues work on, on XR devices. Um, so I think in the end, that sort of constellation of personal devices can work together more seamlessly. Mm -hmm. right, so even if you don't, I think the phone's going to be a very important part of your life, uh, you know, I, I believe, um, in the foreseeable future. But if you don't have your phone, you've decided uh, not to have your phone, and you want to go running with just your watch, then yeah, your watch and your phone should sort of should work very well together. I think XR devices um, as an input device, really to that constellation, can be always on visually, uh, always providing, always listening, always providing you uh, audio input, even if the phone is in your pocket. I think that's very powerful to extend that constellation of personal devices. But then I see these continuing to work together. So are we? Are we going to move to a different place where we don't um, rely on this kind of constant connection to that constellation of devices? No, I don't think so. I think it's going to continue to be very important. So do you think, do you see XR, XR, do you see AI more as a connector of all of these devices so that as a user I'm going to take more or more as, or as a, a disruptor when it comes to mobility? I think of each of these devices, XR in particular, as, as really an, a natural extension of that sort of handset experience. You have a great uh, experience here. You can do incredible, for example, image capture with the phone, right, with the camera on the phone. But sometimes it's in your pocket. So sometimes I want to take it out of my pocket and then use it explicitly, uh, but sometimes I don't. I just want to be able to say, uh, can you remind me the last time I met that person? I don't want to take out my phone and take a picture and then say, please remind me. Instead, it's just a natural kind of extension of what the phone can do. Um, a way to kind of break down some of these um, borders. So I see AI really as this, uh, as this integrator. Right? You know it, right now we know it can be done. You know you can take a picture with your glasses and you can move it to your phone and you can do that search. But the question is, yeah, how can we have systems that, that help the user go from what's a concept to reality uh, more quickly and more efficiently without having to become a techie and learn every right. uh, step in that. Right, so this is what I hope is that really the the, the potential future for AI is really bridging these kinds of boundaries between devices, boundaries between apps, boundaries between ecosystems. I really appreciate you spending a few minutes with me in beautiful San Diego and uh, in a place where I've been a few times uh, just surrounded by uh, some, actually, of your devices. Thank you for being here, and thank you all. Thank you.